just if you notice the recording uh, button, just so that you are aware. Um, so we'll get started because I think it's time. Uh, so good afternoon and good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the Excellence in Agronomy 2030 launching event. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank you all uh, for taking your time to tune in from very different locations. Uh, my name is Jonathan Odong, and I am a communication and knowledge sharing coordinator here at IITA. Um, but for this meeting, I will be the facilitator or the moderator for the session. And my job during this uh, event is going to be fairly straightforward um, to help all of us to be able to engage, have great conversation, and hopefully create enough momentum for the excellence in Agronomy 2030 initiative. Now to effectively engage during this uh, event, please I would like all of us to start from some basics because I am aware that not all of us are quite familiar with the Zoom platform which we happen to be using for this call. So let me highlight a few functionalities that you will find handy in the course of this virtual launch. Um, first and foremost uh, is the mute button. Um, when you are not talking and somebody else is presenting, I would like to request all of us to mute ourselves. Um, we'll try and as much as possible to help all of you mute if there is a challenge there, but please uh, get a hold of that so that we don't have any interference with the presentations. Um, the second thing that I would like to highlight is that we are going to have two options for contributing to discussions during this event. The first one will be to directly offer your feedback during the scheduled plenary sessions. Um, this will be announced during the agenda. We'll do that uh, at different points when we have those, those uh, plenary sessions. Uh, since it is a Zoom uh, uh, platform, you'll be able to raise your hand and, and so on when you want to make a point, and that will give you a chance to do so. The second way in which we will engage is through the chat box. And the chat feature is located in the middle of the Zoom window. And at various segments during the call, we'll read out the messages on the chat box and provide responses. Uh, all this will also be captured as part of the report, which I mentioned earlier, that we will prepare for this meeting. Now, we value all your contributions and feedback, so please use these features as much as possible to engage. Um, for our presenters who are going to share with us different uh, uh, presentations this afternoon. Um, I think you have all received uh, well in advance communication about the timings that you have been allocated. So please uh, kindly assist us to keep that time uh, so that we can uh, finish this uh, event right on time. Now, um, as I announced earlier, um, for those who are just joining once again, I would like to mention that we are recording this call. Uh, part of it is for documentation, and uh, a report out of this will be shared with all of us uh, at the end of the meeting. Now, I will quickly transition to um, the first uh, speaker, at least now with all those logistical issues done. Um, and our first speaker will be Dr. Martin Croft, who will talk about the one CGIR and agronomy research and development. Now, uh, Dr. Martin Croft is the Director General of the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center. But more importantly, he will be speaking uh, in this forum in his capacity as the co-chair of the One CGIR Transition Advisory Group, TAG2, which is developing a high level 2030 research strategy for the CGIR. Martin, please proceed. You will have five minutes, Martin. Welcome. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, you hear me, I hope, huh? Very well, Martin. And can see me. So uh, indeed, uh, DG of Simit, but uh, with a lot of um, research in Africa, 40, 50 percent, and of course a lot of agronomy, sustainable intensification, and intense, uh, intense integrated approaches. So, but indeed, I will today be more speaking on behalf of the whole CGIR and the um, uh, the group that we have been working on with donors and DGs and science leaders on developing a new strategy. Um, that hopefully soon will also be shared with stakeholders. Uh, it's also based on stakeholders' opinions. So um, many of you know, of course, that the CG is undergoing significant changes. It's evolving and becoming more united, uh, and it's consolidating all of its partnerships, its knowledge and assets. Uh, a very important step 
in um, our 50, 60 years uh, old uh, existence. Now, the original mission to solve hunger is, of course, still SDG 2, still a very important one and a central one. But now we must address it in a wider way with more SDGs to embrace a systems transformation approach for food, land and water systems to deliver access to affordable, sufficient and healthy diets. And of course, decent employment within environmental uh, limits of environmental boundaries. So that's more or less our vision that we put pretty central in our strategy. Now, excellence in agronomy uh, will play, hopefully, a key role in this. Um, so across agricultural production systems, low crop yields, big yield gaps, and inadequate incomes from agriculture are more the rule than the exception. Um, and especially also in Africa, but also in South Asia. So agronomy to help improving crop management is crucial, next to breeding. But we can't do it all with breeding, we can't do it only with agronomy, we need the combination there. Um, at the same time, the asks of agriculture have evolved beyond food security. So now they include a broader range of SDGs like sustainable land management, climate change, uh, provision of healthy diets, nutrition and inclusive economic growth. So none of these goals will be achieved without the large scale adoption of improved and adapted agronomic and agroecological practices. So to this end, several centers have in, in initiated the creation of a CGIR Right Excellence in Agronomy Initiative, aiming at reducing yield uh, gaps uh, and efficiency gaps for uh, major crops uh, at scale. So the time to launch this Excellence in Agronomy is now, and we are very happy that we can do it together as CGIR, together with the partners, super important here uh, today. So, the demand from agronomy R&D has diversified from a focus on productivity to broader, broader impacts goals such as climate change, adaptation, mitigation and sustainable intensification. So these longer term outcomes cannot be delivered by multiple time limited and dispersed projects. It requires a longer term and better coordinated efforts such as excellence in agronomy. The demand for agronomy R&D has increased substantially over the past decade from private and public sector partners. Excellence in Agronomy is proposed as a sort of central channel to answer this demand and to bring coherence in our effort globally of all the centers. So the field of agronomy, as most of you will know, of course, has changed considerably in the last 10 years with the availability of technology, such as data science, remote sensing tools, geospatial analytics that really took a big step, and decision support tools, uh, artificial intelligence, and so on. So excellence in agronomy is proposed as a structure that champions this new era of agronomy based on data-driven approaches at scale in the global south, learning from each other and do it efficiently. But still, you can have nice technologies and tools when the agronomy, the knowledge of the crops and um, animals in some cases as well, you're not going to get there. So we need to make sure that we uh, have a good understanding of agronomy. Now, one CGIR is on a mission to transform agri-food systems and good agronomy remains an essential component in all those systems. Um, the innovations in agronomy and improved crop management practices are important to the impact to, for example, to close the yield gaps, increase productivity is necessary there, but also to better manage and improve efficiencies in the use of inputs, labor, nutrients and water. And in many cases, people have to increase the use of nutrients uh, to increase uh, productivity as well. So um, then also increasing profitability to make it more efficient, reduce production risks, reduce negative uh, environmental impact of agriculture. And of course, to maintain and reclaim natural production base, such as the soils. A lot of new attention is necessary there. So crucial for, for the impact areas in the new strategy of the CGIR. So following the successful example of the excellence in breeding platform that was initiated to donors as well, uh, now ongoing for three, four years, and recognizing that the expression of genetic gain requires not only new genetics, but also the adoption of appropriate agronomic practices and agroecological practices developed and deployed at scale. Excellence in agronomy is of course proposed. So foresighting and targeting, of context specific and integrated interventions are key to achieve larger impact at scale. 
and prioritize the development investments and are an important component of excellence in agronomy. And our donors are also very clear in the tech tool in the last couple of months, we need impact at scale. But also very importantly, we need to make it demand driven. So that's crucial in this new strategy that it's not centers just coming in and this is what we're gonna do, but together with our partners, the NARS, the private sector, and in the end, the consumers, of course, in our mind, we need to make sure that we work on the right uh, agenda. And that's what we try to do in, the, in this tech too. So one CG will be better aligned and prioritize a cross learning in order to improve the current agronomy R&D pipeline, increasing efficiencies in the development and in the delivery of solutions through increased collaboration. Collaboration between the centers in the CG, which will be now one organization, and of course, uh, with our partners, uh, as we do now, but we'll be do even more effective, hopefully, in the future. So sustainable intensification, agronomy, and agroecology has been proposed as one of the key science domains in this new strategy. So I look forward to the session today. Uh, I will share it with my colleagues as well. And I thank ITA for taking initiative uh, in this uh, uh, Excellence in Agronomy uh, platform that we hopefully will be forming. And um, so hopefully we'll hear much more of this and be more effective, even more effective than we were in the future. Thank you so much. Jonathan, you might need to unmute your microphone. Yeah, thank you very much, Martin, for setting the stage quite early. Um, we'll quickly switch over then to the next um, opening remarks again, uh, which is going to come from uh, Dr. Christian Witt. Uh, he will give us some insights about the key ingre ingredients of successful agronomy at scale. Um, just by introduction, Dr. Witt is a senior program officer for agriculture and development at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, Christian, please, if you're on the call, unmute and proceed, please. Thank you, Jonathan, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Hello. I'd like to thank the organizers for um, inviting me to the launch of this exciting new initiative, uh, which we believe could make a significant contribution to agriculture on the continent in the coming years and thereby closing an important gap in research. Now, let me step into the shoes of a small scale producer for a second and imagine I am <clears throat> working with my family on a small farm. My soils are relatively poor. I am on a highly weathered uh, con uh, soils and on, on the continent and um, there are several things that need to come together uh, for me uh, to really uh, sustain farming, on, on, especially in the context of climate change. As I experience more risks related to highly vari variable weather uh, conditions. So um, the agronomic interventions on my farm have a large impact. They can uh, really support climate change adaptation in many ways. Uh, so if I improve my soil health, if I uh, can adopt practices that increase, for example, rooting depth uh, and or, or care for better soil water retention for increased yield stability and resilience to these changes in temperatures and rainfall. And there are many farming practices that, um, uh, you know, are, are um, uh, optional here for me. So including cropping system optimization, the time of crop establishment, inclusion of legumes and water saving technologies. There are many different uh, opportunities uh, for me to um, really manage my farm. Yet what I need is I need good access to uh, advice, advisory, I need risk and financial management tools, I need, uh, you know, access to market so I can sell produce uh, of the farm. Um, and all these uh, different services, they need to come together, they need to reach me at the right time. So the underlying agronomy and soil health research is a key enabler for those serving me as a small scale producer. And they have, are extremely important because you, as you know, I'm not alone. I have millions of small scale producers next to me 
who uh, have faced similar uh, situations. So there is a tension for research always. How do you deal with a solution that works at a field or a farm? But the challenge uh, that I'm facing is that I have to do this over very large areas. And we have learned a lot in certain um, aspects here on how to work at scale. For example, we have innovative methods for digital soil mapping. So we have much better understanding on uh, the uh, soil conditions on the continent at various scales, which allows uh, those who are serving me as a small uh, scale producer uh, with, with better advice or better solutions, for example, on how to deal with soil acidity. Now, uh, the landscape is changing, as we all know. Uh, so, uh, farmer services are increasingly integrated, bundled. There's new business models and innovative approaches. There are many different actors in the space, a very vibrant uh, um, uh, ecosystem. And I think this is the moment for agronomy research to reflect and think, how do we now address this demand, this new demand from governments, from uh, service providers, from private sector for information. And so I am really grateful that this CG and the national systems, this is a strong partnership between regional and national research systems uh, to take on this challenge. Um, this is an incubation phase. Uh, building off on, on, on many um, uh, progressive projects uh, and the task that the group has taken on is to uh, uh, really innovate together and uh, we are extremely uh, supportive and excited about this opportunity for uh, really filling this uh, important gap that we can only address together across uh, the various players in the system. So uh, we're looking forward to the next year and a half and uh, I wish you all the best for this initiative. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, we will now shift gears uh, a bit and transition to six short presentations that are basically meant to give us an inside track look at uh, excellence in Agromi 2030. Um, the first of this series of brief presentations will be given by Dr. Bernard Van Lawes, who will talk us through a presentation titled Excellence in Agronomy 2030, a new CGIR-wide initiative to deliver agronomy solutions at scale. Now, Dr. Van Lawes is the Director of Central Africa and Natural Resource Management Research Team at IITA. Importantly, he is also leading the team drawn from the CGIR private sector and public sector in uh, getting the excellence in agronomy 2030 going. Bernard, uh, over to you. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Can you confirm that you see my screen? Not yet, Bernard. Could you share? Uh, yes. Share, yeah. Okay, yeah, sure, yeah. You should see it now. Yep. So put it in presentation mode, yeah. Yeah, very good. Thanks, uh, all participants. Thanks also for the introductory remarks. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of content on what this excellence in agronomy 2030 is about. And I think the tagline that you see now already says a lot. We want to deliver agronomic gain at scale for the sustainable intensification of smallholder systems in the global south. An alternative tagline could be we have achieved quite a bit with excellent, with agronomy, R&D, and the CGR, but we can do more, better, and faster, and cheaper if we have a coordinated R&D effort in, in the context of the one CGIR. Agronomy is the key if we want to deliver on, on some of the challenges of today. And the way we are framing agronomy at scale is the science of integrative soil and crop management that accounts for spatial and temporal variability towards targeted advisories that account for yield profitability, risk and sustainability, and the diverse requirements of, of end users. So it's really about it's really about the, the management dimension of the G times E times M equation. What we mean with management is As Akim Doberman used to say once in a while, 
Um, farmers take like 10 to 20 decisions related to their production systems, and each of those interact with other farming system components. So what we really want to do in excellence in agronomy, we want to use agronomy as an entry point towards addressing those challenges I referred to. We've, I think Martin referred to productivity, sustainability and climate change. And we will embrace key research, key systems research topics while avoiding some of the challenges and pit pitfalls that were encountered by the earlier system CRPs. Uh, we can dwell on that later on if, if needed. I think the right time for such an initiative was already justified by, by Martin very well. He talked about the need for agronomy to support breeding if, if we want to see the, the yield increases we are, we are anticipating in smallholder conditions. Uh, Christian and Martin talked about advancements in science. They both referred to an increased demand in the public and the private sector for agronomy solutions. And then, of course, we have the CGR reform. Which is, uh, which is also, of course, providing the right context to talk about such initiatives. Now, Excellence in Agronomy is being developed with 10 centers. Uh, they are here on the map. And in the recent agronomy program assessment, we've actually seen that those centers have about 130 agronomists engaged in over 140 initiatives and, and taking about 10 to 15 percent of the, of the current CGR budget. But what is also very important that most of that funding is happening through time-bound projects. There is a link here and on the slide to the APA report in case you want to see more. So you could say if the time is right and, and, and if you have all the skills and people all over the CGI, why, why do we need a separate initiative? And I think there are two main reasons for that. One is there are quite a number of market failures which have prevented agronomy from reaching scale. And as we know, market failures are or, uh, or uh, dissociations between the demand for agronomy solutions and the supply of, of those solutions. There's quite a number of reasons for that, and I've given a few bullets here without trying to be complete the lack of understanding of what people need. A limited short-term assessment of change to have rapid turnover of recommendations, and so on and so on. And there is a number of organizational deficits. Uh, the way we often take decisions to, to invest in agronomy, with this sort of uh, often opportunistic decision making, uh, was already referred to most agronomy R&D as specific short term projects which do not allow for, for retaining essential skills and tools. And that project nature also does not facilitate the exchange of experience and learning. Again, in the concept paper that I've referred to, there's a lot more information on that than analyzes on why we need such, such initiative. With all those centers, we have developed a vision that refers to the tagline. It's about delivering agronomic gain. And we want to do this to have an integrated system framework that focuses on data-driven solutions at scale for smallholder farming systems, responding to demand, towards the sustainable intensification of those systems. I think I've used those terms before. So in a sense, you could say that uh, excellence in agronomy will really respond directly or indirectly to those global challenges that the one CGR has set for itself between now and, and 2030. Now, I've used quite a lot of words and, and terms and whatever, but what does it mean in practice? How are we going to deliver that purpose? And as I, as I said, with the, the, through co-development process with all the centers that I've referred to, we've, we've identified four key, what we call modules, that would help us deliver on, on, uh, on the vision. Um, one module has very much to do with internal organization. Uh, as I said, we can do much better, and there's a number of key functions there. Ex-ante impact assessment, we need the objective prioritization, strategy to specific agroecologies. We need to map demand for agronomy R&D. We need an assessment framework for agronomy gain KPIs. What do we mean with that? And then we'll have some governance systems set up, including external advisory board and a donor interest group. The second module is about transform. There we host all the data tools, really the engine, the core, the core uh, public goods that the excellence and agronomy would work around. I will not dwell on that because there's a number of slides coming up uh, that will provide a little bit more context. 
The third module we call Innovate. That's really where we will do new science on priority R and V topics, but based again on express needs for such innovation R and D. And the fourth component we call it Deliver. That's really well where we will work around demand-driven use cases that are formulated about verified potential for impact on scale. So this is where the demand is hosted, and I will come back to that very soon. So a few other traits that are probably important to mention today. There's a lot more to say, but as I said, we have a concept paper that describes that. I just wanted to highlight a number of other dimensions. One is that we are really planning to target specific agroecologist countries within the global south with a number of impact goals. And they are here summarized. It's about yields and profitability for key crops, but also about resource use efficiencies it's about yield stability, especially against climate change, and it's improving soil health. So it's more than just about yield, it's about all those different traits that will ultimately result in sustainably intensified systems. And the focus of each of those KPIs will vary between, between different regions, as already well expressed in the draft research strategy of, of the one CGIR. So what we will do, um, we will set up an internal and external KPI framework, KPI framework to measure the efficiency and value added of excellence in agronomy and to measure achievements in agronomy gain over space and time. The second a dimension I wanted to highlight, we know there is a gender gap in agricultural productivity. There's a number of reports on, on the left, you see a slide of that. We see that the yield gap between men and women accounts for about 20 to 30 percent, mostly related to differences in resource use. So we will be very explicit about gender dimensions to advisory, to the support systems we want to develop and ensure we do something about this productivity gap. We will co-invest in this area with the gender platform. We have started that discussion. And we want to generate evidence on how gender interacts, interacts with the agronomy services. And thirdly, and it was mentioned agroecology, the 10 elements are ex presented here as, as uh, summarized by FAO. But we embrace those elements of agroecology while we are being agnostic on how best those elements are translated into actual smallholder farming systems. As a part of the CGR, which is a research consortium, we will be driven by science and data and evidence with a particular focus on assessing what works where, for whom and why. Christian referred to it, we are lucky we have an incubation phase that started last month that will last for 24 months. And we will try to deliver a number of outputs, all related to the four modules and activating and testing some of the hypothesis. We will work on the external organization of the framework. Uh, we will work and implement through a number of limited demand-driven use cases. We hope to prepare a large project or big lift or whatever the term is being used now in the context of the one CGIR during this incubation too. And we need to socialize this initiative. And I think what we do today is one step towards that with, with all partners and the donor community and, and other interested units. In terms of those use cases, we have identified 10 of those for the next 24 months. Six of those operating in Sub-Saharan Africa with various partners in various countries on various cropping systems. There's, for, for instance, one in Rwanda on the agronomy advisory for potato-based systems led by SIP with ISDA as a demand partner. In Asia, we have three use cases. One, for instance, led by um, ICARDA in Egypt, the government of Egypt on web-based advisory for in-season yield and potential and water productivity. And then we have uh, one in Latin America, but operating in three countries uh, led by SIP. So we want to demonstrate that those demand-driven use cases can actually deliver agronomy gain through a process that I've just described. One example, for instance, the digital green use case led by SIAT in Ethiopia. I think most of us know digital green. They want to reach 25,000 farmers in the next few years with advisory on increased wheat production and quality. So we will work with them on wheat, restaurant surveillance and management, planting data advisory and nutrient management. There is a platform that will be used to, to connect farmers with that information. This is a partnership with Digital Green, the Ethiopian National Research System, the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, GIZ, and then the Soils Consortium 
uh, supported by USAID. So I will stop here. Now there are a number of contributions, five minutes each, uh, from colleagues who have who are actually going to demonstrate that we have made quite a bit of impact or, or uh, good results with agronomy at scale initiatives, just to show that we are not starting from, from zero. So thanks for listening and back to you, Jonathan. Thank you very much, Bernard. Um, yeah, so I would like to invite then our next set of presenters. Uh, they're going to highlight various uh, examples of agronomy at scale. Um, the first one will be Dr. Kazuki Saito, who will share examples related to site-specific nutrient management, SSNM for cereal crops. Um, Dr. Kazuki is a principal mm -hmm. scientist at the Africa Rice Center. Uh, so Kazuki, please proceed. Bernard, hello. Yes. yes. Shall I shall I start? Hello, Jonathan. We should actually start now, uh, Jonathan. Remember, we've we've changed those the order of those units. So Andy, please go Andy. ahead. Okay, Andrew, uh, if you're ready, then please go ahead. Yeah. Jonathan, um, I'm here, but my screen share is disabled. Can you uh, give me the okay. ability to share? Yeah, okay, so um, we have somebody else running the controls, but um, could I run the slides for you and, and, and you just talk through them? Um, no, it should be okay now. Just hang on one sec. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody, or in the morning, if you're in the US like I am. Um, bear with me for one sec. Uh, so my name is uh, Andy McDonald. Um, thanks a lot uh, to Bernard and the whole EIA team for inviting me to talk today. I uh, just have a few brief remarks on leveraging ex ante assessment methods um, for intervention priority setting. You know, we all know that um, it's not just the, the technical excellence that we have in a, in a particular domain or, or situation, but it's how we collectively decide uh, where we're going to work, where we're going to expend our effort and our budgets. Um, I'm going to just briefly touch on this. A lot of my co-authors here are people that I worked with in the Serial Systems Initiative for South Asia. I did that before I joined uh, Cornell uh, when I was with CIMIT through 2018, but also on behalf of Jordan Chamberlain, who will lead this work stream within EIA. Um, Jonathan, do you have control of the... Okay. So... Um, we all know how uh, decisions are usually made in projects uh, and also beyond projects and investment portfolios, but they're typically a mix of things like expert judgment, demand characterization, the legacy of what we worked on in the past, and also expertise inertia. We tend to do things that we're comfortable with and we stick with them. These are all extremely useful um, frames, but they're also often insufficient. And the basic premise within EIA is that ad hoc priority setting often erodes the value of new investment. And our hypothesis is that if we can prioritize uh, in a more rigorous manner before new investments are made, the, the likelihood of transformative impacts will increase. So the challenge for us within EIA is to determine how we can use the tools and perspectives of modern, modern agronomy and systems analysis to make priority setting more transparent, efficient, and data-driven to support uh, these rapid transitions that, that Bernard has explained uh, towards sustainable multifunctional agriculture. Next, Jonathan. Am I controlling or are you? <laughs> Jonathan, I'm not sure if you're advancing the slides or if I am. Uh, there we go. Okay, so as Bernard talked about and Christian mentioned, we're not starting at zero. You know, we've had a very strong decade of reinvestment in Ag R4D, and we've learned a lot uh, along the way. And new methods for doing things like ex ante prioritization are, are really coming to the fore. Uh, I'm giving you an example here of uh, something that we did in the CISA project. Serial Systems Initiative in South Asia. When we went into the third phase of the project in 2016, Christian Witt said to us collectively, uh, how can you justify where you're expending your efforts? And we didn't have a compelling 
answer to that at that point. And it forced us to think through what we were valuing, uh, valuing and why. And we came up with a way of doing this that combines things like field reconnaissance data for profitability um, and, prof uh, and productivity, but also looked at uh, the spatial dimensions of opportunity. And uh, we crowdsourced judgments on scaling potential and risk and other things. And we combined those things into an investment index that helped guide where we allocated our efforts. Next slide, Jonathan. And so giving an example here of uh, what that permitted us to do, uh, this is an example of in coastal addition in India, uh, there's a tremendous amount of production potential that can be tapped through better agronomy and water resources development. But that transition that I'm showing from fallow to profitable crop rarely happens. And through the, the ex ante approach, we asked ourselves a whole bunch of tough questions about why these transitions weren't happening and what the role of better agronomy and water resources development might be. And I won't uh, go into the details here, but through these types of analytics, we were able to say what, where, and how among candidate interventions. And we ended up de-emphasizing things, some things that had a very strong technical case, but that didn't have a strong scaling case. Next slide, Jonathan. So uh, we're going to, the, the intention within EIA is to use some of these examples to springboard into um, a, a really robust way of understanding opportunity space to order, in order to uh, adequately prioritize investment. And in EIA, the, the way that that will happen is through the development of an integrated tool stack that spans scales of analysis. So uh, from the 30,000 feet sort of eco-regional approaches that really get the broad picture right all the way down to technological intervention points uh, and trying to bridge effectively those scales of analysis so that we're able to look at things comprehensively and have those scales of analysis inform each other. The ambition is to have that uh, in, in reflected in a flexible and open framework that will be able to set priorities according to differences in local and national scale development objectives. And crucially, this will be used both within EIA to set priorities going into a, a larger project, but also uh, a, a, with an external orientation by, uh, with the ambition of providing a core set of services and analytical methods that can be used by development banks, national institutions, and more broadly by the donor community to inform priority setting and investment design. And critically, this is not just the agronomists that will be engaged with this, but the associate economists, and the policy folks and others with relevant expertise uh, that is really needed to drive these things in, in a coherent manner. Uh, thanks very much. Unmute, please, Jonathan. So, Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kazuki Saito. I'm going to talk about site-specific nutrient management, SSN, on behalf of uh, colleagues listed here. So SSNM is not something very new. The approach was developed in 1990s for cereals in Asia to address challenges listed in this uh, slide. Over the last 25 years, SNM has evolved in its science and decision support tools, covering a number of clubs and the countries in Asia and Africa. With advance in ICT uh, technology, digital decision support tools such as Rice Crop Manager, Rice Advice, Nutrient Expert have been developed and uh, disseminated for scaling of the SNM. In this my talk, I'm going to talk about uh, results uh, from meta-analysis uh, and also I'm going to talk about the dissemination efforts, especially focus on rice. So we perform a meta-analysis using 62 papers uh, to compare SNM with farmer's practice. We focus on maize, rice, and wheat. What we found is that the across three clubs, SSNM can uh, provide with higher yield, more profit, higher nitrogen use efficiency, 
and lower nitrogen rate than farmers practice. This finding is clearly indicated that the uh, SLM can enhance productivity and sustainability of the major cereals. So now dissemination, I'm going to talk about rice crop manager, which has been developed by International Rice Research Institute, uh, disseminated mainly in Philippines and India. And the rice advice has been developed by Africa Rice and disseminated mainly in West Africa. The Philippines had a large number of advice uh, generated since 2013, mainly due to the strong uh, government support and also strong extension services there. And yield gain, typical yield gain is similar uh, across countries. Uh, and also this is similar to what we found in our meta-analysis. Typical profit gain uh, is higher, especially in Africa. This is due to the high uh, paddy price in Nigeria. In outlook in, uh, related to excellence in uh, agronomy, excellence in agronomy could improve knowledge exchange on SSNM among the center and the partners. Then SSNM can further improve, like integration of the SNM with digital soil map or weather forecasting, and also integration of the SSNM across clubs. Uh, excellence in Agolono, we will co develop new decision support tool together with the partners in several use cases in this incubation phase. Now, assessing of the agronomic gain equaling the lapsed yield assessment is one of the key challenges for monitoring impact of the SSNM and also the other agronomic interventions. Large, uh, there are large variations in yields in the farmer's field require many observations measuring yield needs time, labor, and money. So we are developing deep learning based approach uh, by using photos uh, taken in the fields. So by using more than 6,000 uh, 6, RGB image of rice, uh, our preliminary results show that our model can predict 73% of the uh, variation in rice yields. In Outlook, so we really would like to have more data and uh, for the improving the prediction and the robustness. And we would like to also develop tools for users uh, for the quick use for our uh, approach. Then our approach can be also extended to the estimation of the biomass and other crop like wheat. This is all from my presentation. Good. Um, thank you very much, uh, Saito. Um, could we hear the next uh, slide from Tilahun? Tilahun, please. Can you put the slide on, please? Yeah. You'd like me to share for you, Tilahun? Yeah, here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my presentation is capitalizing on what our colleagues have said, and I'm going to present a showcase from Ethiopia on agronomic efficiency of fertilizer use. And I'm working for ICRSAT. Uh, um, as you may know, you know there has been a lot of uh, a lot of uh, you know concern that fertilizer use in Africa is very low. On the other hand, countries which are using and importing fertilizer, the return per investment is very low. For example, in Ethiopia, there is an import of about 1.2 million tons of fertilizer per year, but uh, you know yield level and the return is very low, partly because of very high diversity of farming systems. Here, for example, you see four different farming systems, which are wheat systems. So here, a mountainous area with upstream downstream relationships. Here, undulated, eroded, very um, degraded landscape. And here, flat, tiny lands, fragmented landscapes. And here, more of commercial large scale with production systems. So how do you really uh, recommend fertilizer 
for wheat in these diverse systems. And that is really what we wanted to, to clear. Uh, in most of the Ethiopian highlands, you know, this relationship is very, very common. And this is true also for countries like, you know, Rwanda, Uganda, Congo. And when we assess you know, the, the yield levels, the impact of variability of landscapes compared to the effect of inputs, like for example, in this case, K, in fact, uh, input, the effect of the input is much lower compared to the effect of the landscape. That is related to uh, parameters which are um, really related to soils, slopes, positions, um, and agroecology. And this is, for example, uh, a map created by the soil, uh, uh, the soil group in Ethiopia, the ETA group, the Akacha Transformation Agency, which has used soil mapping. And from there, which is based on soil test based fertilizer recommendation, you could see here the whole district is somehow uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur uh, deficit, that is really what's recommended. When we overlay our algorithms on this soil test based map, using these parameters, we are able to identify the spots where you get the highest return, the green ones, and we get the, least, the, the lowest return, which are the red ones. So, in a system, it's still possible to identify niches where there will be maximum production productivity. Uh, and when we try to scale up to and test it into multiple locations, districts in Japan, about 28 districts, we were able to capture, you know, and pick with a position of about 65 to 70 percent using these models. Some places much, much more precise than in other places. And this shows that there's a serious gap still, you know, there's a need to find in terms of these methods, generate new data. And that's where we came in to, to, to work on, you know, on these issues with AI, first to respond to the demand, um, but also to identify the gaps and, and, and um, improve uh, the, the data capturing processes, but also to improve our data analysis methods uh, using improved statistical techniques so that we have more reliable algorithms that can be used elsewhere. And that hopefully will lead us to the development of a decision support tool, which can be generic enough to be used. Uh, but also we are planning to use more of the available data as well, besides our institutions. And in Ethiopia, we built a, 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 a coalition called the College of the Willing, where everybody has to put the data together. And this work has been supported by uh, GIZ and uh, the future of USAID. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tilahun. Um, thank you. So we've had a couple of examples. I think that we are listening to the last one now, which is on uh, Akilimo, which is a toolbox to guide agronomy at scale. Uh, this will be presented by Meklit. Meklit is a data scientist at IIT. Meklit, please go ahead. Okay. Okay, good. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for giving me this chance. So I will present you a bit of a, a in a very brief way, Akilimo, which we build having an eye on uh, making agronomy deliver uh, working solution at the scale. So when we look at into in general, delivering a working solution demand is starting from the questions asked and then building a community around it based on the complexity of the questions asked and the, the demand required. So in that way, Akilimo is doing just that where, um, wait, yeah, uh, we are working with, with agricultural development partners, they being the closest to the farmers, naturally they define, of course, the objective of the research, but it's not only that, they are also partner to scale for, for the product that we will present at the end um, by forming community of practices. Uh, um, and to 
to provide solution, there is two aspects to it. The first one will be networking with the scientific community. Therefore, we will be able to source innovative solutions. But on the other hand, we also need um, partnering with um, uh, scaling, scaling, linking with the scaling partners. Therefore, there are ad different aspects that we learned while, while working with an Akilimo, the parameters that we need to look at and we can pr bring this expertise, this ex uh, experience to excellence in agronomy, like evaluating the outreach models, what kind of segment of farmers that these partners are addressing, it all defines into the solution that we, that we produce. And there is another, another aspect uh, of partnership where the digital solution, solution providers are coming into a play um, that basically helps us to deliver not only answers specifically to, 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 to the agronomy question, because the quest, if we look at into the question, mostly what is asked as you fairly put it is how to increase crop productivity. And the answer that requires is quite complex because this question is multifaceted. And in that way, that is why we need really, when we say demand driven, it's not only the, the question that is asked or it's not just only the small scale farmers that we see in answering that question, there are quite a number of partners that need to come into, into play. And Akilimo has been working uh, to, to expand, to cover as much as possible different aspects beyond only telling you need to apply that level of fertilizers. And um, this experience is what Akilimo can, can bring into excellence in agronomy. And the other one is if we think of giving a working solution at a scale, because at this moment then we are working in a matrix of several use cases, several partners, um, and a different way of delivery, right? So if we are working in that one, one of the question will be working in many use cases at large locations will require a smart agronomy data management system because we have our, our solutions are coming from the ground truths. And that is what Akilimo has. Technically, that is the, 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 the Sandman, we call it, which it enabled us conducting a large number of trials, capturing our data in a very standardized form, storing it centrally. Once this is done, we are able to, uh, we do have a suite of scripts to, to curate the data, to connect it, to make it available, but not only the field data, but all other relevant data that we need for the next step, which is the, 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 the data analytics. So the, um, one of the, the learnings or the experience of Akilimo is the agronomy intelligence. The agronomy intelligence part, we can see it in, dif in three different ways. One is the analytics part. So we do have um, a data analytics or prediction engine that is built on a modular basis where the crop models, the machine learning, the economic optimum, all these things are built in a modular base and we can take it, test it, improve it, adapt it, for, therefore it will be used with for other projects. Other projects can start from where we stop and go further. We tested it with new locations and new crops as well, and we have seen already increasing, in, encouraging results there. Next to the data analytics, we do have, um, Akilimo is not, or, of course we do have a mobile application called Akilimo, but it's not just a mobile application, it is beyond that, we do have, a versatile and adaptable tools. Next to taking into account the crop productivity limiting factors, we are also taking, um, we, are, we, are, we are delivering solutions. For instance, there are paper-based solutions to it. We are working with digital service providers to produce uh, chatbots to, 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 to bring advice to farmers who have only, uh, not, do not have uh, these fancy uh, telephones. And in, uh, with VMO, we are working with IVR. So that is also another dimension that agronomy need to grow in um, that we see. And of course, as I said, the digital service providers, mainly they bring the expertise that we don't have as, as agricultural researchers and scientists. And on top of that, in, in, in increasing the content that we have not only agronomy based advice, but the credit access, input access, market, this kind of thing is, comes together. 
with with um, with the digital service provider in a partnership that we have and recently we are learning quite interesting lessons there so at the end if we think of akilimo 2.0 under within in, in excellence in agronomy one thing is that excellence in agronomy is creating a platform where um where several expertise are coming in a structured way to collaborate and deliver therefore we can one integrate the tool we have at this time and two we can share a lesson and another one is we can pull expertise there are low hanging fruits because we believe there are disconnected but innovative solutions that are developed in all the partners that are coming together now under under excellence in agronomy if we work together we believe that we will be able to to step forward to go ahead in a measured step and that is what Akilimo 2.0 is hoping to to achieve in excellence in agronomy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Meklit. Um, yeah, so uh, we have two final uh, case studies which are looking now are more forward looking. The, the, the past four examples we had were more, you know, what has been done. So because of the collaborative nature of excellence in agronomy. Um, Me? Hello? Meklis, could you please mute your microphone? Um, Sorry. Yeah. So uh, because of that collaborative nature, uh, these two final presentations will uh, provide us uh, a site about how the project is going to look at the issue of fair data and turnkey solutions as building blocks of excellence in agronomy for 2030. Now, this is going to be a two-part presentation by Peter Pipers. And Peter is a senior agronomist at IITA and is a leader for East Africa in the Africa Cassava Agronomy Initiative. Then the second part will be by Mether, who is a senior research fellow at IFPRI, and she leads one of the three modules of the CGIR platform on the big data in agriculture. So Mether Devare, I, I believe you are starting. Could you please proceed? You have 10 minutes between you and Peter. You can share it equally. Great. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, so I am Meda Devare at um, uh, working with the Big Data Platform um, and based at IFPRI. So uh, what Peter and I are going to be talking about today is uh, uh, the, the, the Transform module. And the, the module envisions development of infrastructure to facilitate quick response to new demands, particularly from the deliver module. So broadly speaking, uh, uh, Transform focuses on data and data solutions to help with uh, things like the use, management, uh, and sharing of data, and also with developing demand-driven analytics and turnkey solutions to stakeholders from across sectors. Uh, so Peter will be talking about the, uh, the demand-driven analytics and turnkey solutions, and I'm going to focus on data and data solutions. So, right. Um, this initiative aims to harness, harness digital technologies and data science effectively. Hi, Meda. Yes. Sorry to interrupt. Could you make your presentation full screen? Uh, we are oh, seeing. It it. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It's supposed to be full screen. Hold on one second. Let me get out of this. Yeah, you can share again. Now, can you see it full screen? Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Okay, sure. Sorry about that. Um, right, so the initiative aims to harness digital technologies and data science effectively. And one of the prerequisites for this, uh, well, uh, it, the, the one of the prerequisites is not only solid research in the agronomy space and other spaces, but that the gen data that's generated be open to the fullest extent possible, recognizing that it won't always be open, but for the most part, it does need to be open, and that it be fair, meaning that it needs to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So what I'm trying to do with this slide is to make a case for why that's important. Um, what I'm presenting here is the highlights of work conducted by colleagues at SIAT, uh, CINET, and UC Davis. Uh, they set out wanting to assess the profitability of fertilizer, uh, fertilizer use across Africa. 
what they did uh, to do this was to first look for data. And they used uh, the big data platform's Guardian data portal for this. They found over 200 data sets uh, on fertilizer response, so fertilizer response data, uh, covering about 760 locations in Africa. To make a long story short, they were able to use these data to compute the profitability of fertilizer use. They took into account, in doing this, they took into account the local price of urea. You see that with um, the, the third uh, uh, schematic that I'm showing. Uh, local price of urea and the market price attainable for May, showing where fertilizer use uh, is profitable and where it may not be, even if the yield response is quite good. And you can see that if you spend some more uh, time on the slide, particularly for Uganda, for instance. So as you might imagine, uh, this sort of analysis is useful for a wide range of stakeholders. Uh, but, but it's important to note that, that it would not be possible to come up with this kind of thing if the data were not A, open, so easily findable um, and accessible and reusable as well, uh, even though they're not all interoperable at this stage. So at the very least, uh, the, these data were um, adhered to the F, A, and I, and that's why this kind of analysis, uh, this, this analysis in particular, was able to be done. So um, given that open and fair data solutions uh, are the goal, how are we going to achieve this for uh, excellence in agronomy? A key part of this is going to be changing the culture um, around data management and the, uh, the, you know, interactions with capacity and tools and services uh, play a, a large role in this. Some of our efforts to enable culture, culture change include um, that expectations are made explicit uh, in contracts, uh, that key performance indicators uh, focused on open and, uh, open and fair outputs are put in place um, many of the centers are already doing this. Um, I'm hoping that more centers will uh, be doing this as we go forward. Um, and then that we have a template for data sharing agreements that lay out requirements uh, with our partners in terms of, of data and data management. So that's one part of it, uh, and there are many other pieces. But uh, capacity enhancement plays a big role as well in this. And so this is something we're doing with a small cross-centered team of data managers. Uh, and we'll, we'll include trainings to enable open and fair outputs using a lot of the tools and services from the big data platform. Uh, we plan to have data science workshops, as needed support, of course, uh, uh, to the use cases in particular, uh, to be able to uh, build capacity and use tools and services um, as needed. So some of the tools and services that uh, we want to leverage in, in terms of making it easy for participants to make their outputs open and fair. Uh, these, most of these come from the big data platform. Uh, we've, we, uh, and some of the broad categories are laid out across the top there, metadata, ontologies, fair data, uh, privacy and PI. We have a number of solutions already in place and we want to be able to leverage those. Uh, what I'm showing here in the first shot there is uh, the Guardian data portal I mentioned earlier. Uh, that provides access to over 170,000 publications and almost 28,000 uh, data sets from all across the, the 14 or so CGIR centers. I've lost count how many there actually are now. Um, uh, USAID, DFID, USDA, the World Bank, uh, the Gene Bank platform, and the list continues to grow. Uh, there's also the Government of India's open data portal, among others. Um, but Guardian is much more than a data portal. It's, it's more of a data ecosystem that allows uh, things like data exploration, for instance. So that includes being able to visualize, uh, query, uh, spatially query and download data or pieces of data, um, such as global production estimates for some 30 odd crops uh, and some very, very large, uh, several terabyte climate, uh, the downscale climate uh, data sets, so CNIP 5 and CNIP 6, for instance. You can also collaborate with your project or use case team around finding data, securely sharing it, uh, for, for instance, with sensitive data, uh, writing code, and analyzing data. And this is via an R and Python uh, analytical environment called CG Labs. So I've just brought that up uh, there. And lastly, there are a number of um, actionable how-to sort of uh, materials that are available uh, as, as reference guides uh, that you can use uh, and can be used for training further as well and tools such as uh, FAIR workloads, for instance, uh, to, to make output more easily FAIR and uh, uh, responsibly managed because there's uh, guidance on PII as well as algorithms to allow you to check for personally identifiable information. And lastly, there's a digital data collection tool 
that has been developed called the Agronomy Field Information Management System, or AgroFins. Um, and that allows users to easily set up field books based on interoperability standards uh, for metadata as well as data variables, uh, ontologies in particular. Um, and then to collect data, in a sense, that's already fair. So it, it, you don't have to do any more work to make those outputs uh, fair. So in short, we will be using all of these tools as needed to make uh, uh, excellence in agronomy outputs open and fair with as little pain as possible. And uh, these data sets then will be used uh, going forward to build some of the turnkey solutions. And Peter will now uh, talk about that. So I'll stop sharing. And over to you, Peter. Thank you. Thanks, Meda. I guess I need to also share my screen. All right. Um, so yeah, thank you and good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, my pleasure to then uh, present the last part of these uh, presentations and talk a bit about the analytics and turnkey solutions as part of the um, transform module. So as Bernard said in his uh, in his part, this module really is he called it the engine of the car. Um, you could also call it the toolbox of the initiative. So this is really where all the tools and procedures and workflows and applications um, are being built and integrated um, together um, by the entire team, building on all the efforts um, that have been happening within the CG Institute, various projects um, and beyond. So it's really kind of, you know, creating synergies, integrating, bringing things together and building something which is, is modular so that we can then um, in future when new demands arise, um, respond to those very efficiently and ba basically just build and put those together um, to respond to, to new use cases. Um, this is just an example. My colleague Meklic, she talked about Aquilimo. Every one of these tools and applications and efforts that have happened in the past, they have, they have an infrastructure behind that looks at collecting data, processing data, modeling, predicting, um, creating interfaces to the end users in various ways. So each of these efforts that have happened in the past, they have, they have components. And the idea of the transform module is really to, um, to build onto those, to extract, to generalize, and, and to consolidate. Um, let all those efforts come together and turn them into a, a, a generic toolbox, a set of um, turnkey solutions um, that we then can um, put together for, for, for any new work that we want to do. Um, um, as part of this initiative. So some of the things that are part of this are just a, a, a list here. You could think about research procedures and protocols, more at the, the data collection side. Um, it also talks, we also talk, think about crop modeling or any form of modeling for that matter um, to, to, to spatially and temporally make, make models that can then um, provide predictions um, as, as a part of decision support tools. Any type of integration also of spatial agronomy data, optimization, algorithms, and analytical procedures that, that will be part of any of such um, applications. Of course, a lot of GIS and, and geospatial analysis will be part of this. Uh, and finally, also um, building tools that we can put in the hands of the end users um, or integrate into existing services of, of service providers. Um, like the digital partners that, that um, you've heard um, in some of the use cases being, being served. So in short, um, basically what the transform module does is, is provide the, the essential building blocks in terms of data and data solutions. Um, again, putting together uh, efforts from, from previous projects and institutes um, and then constitute this as a, a core infrastructure to really respond efficiently to, to any new use cases that, that will arise um, in the deliver module, uh, both of the incubation and hopefully later on as well. Um, again, what we really want to do is, is foster synergy. So we want to bring together all the efforts that have happened across the CGR centers and especially also build on, on, on the tools and approaches and um, uh, partnerships that exist within the big data platform. Uh, Meda, Meda gave a couple of examples there. 
Um, and, and lastly, I want to also emphasize that, that everything we'll do will embrace a culture where um, solutions and data is, is shared and made openly available to the wider economy community. And then finally, um, on, on behalf of all the presenters, uh, thanks and I'm looking forward to, to discussions and working with you. Over to you, John. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. And uh, gosh, um, I noticed we are running slightly behind time, but um, I can see already there's quite uh, a bit of discussions going on in the chat. I will still encourage that uh, we keep on posting uh, questions and the presenters will respond directly to them in the chat box. Now, at this point, um, we are approaching uh, towards the end of, of this uh, event, but there's still a few more things for us to do. Now, we've taken note from all the foregoing presentations that um, you know, excellence in agronomy tent that is a multi-stakeholder. It's a multi-stakeholder um, event um, program. And uh, because of this, uh, I would like to pose a few questions directly to three individuals representing the development community, the digital advisory sector, and the agro input industry. Now, um, my first question um, goes out to Aseta Diallo. I hope she's on the call. And Aseta is the program officer for agribusiness at the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, AGRA. And in this case, she is, uh, the question comes to you as a representative of that development community. So Aseta, uh, could you briefly tell us how should uh, the excellence in Agronomy 2030 identify and respond to public demand for agronomy advisory services at scale? Aseta, please. Yes, so thank you, Jonathan. Can you hear me? Very well, Aseta. Yes. yes, okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon or good morning to our listeners. And uh, thank you for involving uh, me, involving AGRA in this very important uh, topic. Uh, as you know, AGRA is uh, the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa and it's putting small older farmers at the center of uh, the growing con continents, growing economy. And uh, as uh, the others have said in the previous uh, presentations, uh, there are a lot of uh, technologies developed uh, out, of, out of there, and uh, AGRA is also part of uh, uh, those who have developed uh, such technologies. Uh, I want to mention uh, improved seed varieties. I want to mention also what has been said already, like uh, multi-nutrient balance fertilizer blend, soil and crop specific. Uh, fertilizer blends for specific geography and crops. Uh, we have uh, also supported the development of uh, uh, other technologies like microdosing technologies, but also cereal legume uh, system supporting, uh, as you know, the legume cropping system is uh, mainly uh, done by women. So supporting women to get more income, uh, but uh, also supporting to this effect, the soil fertility management, and uh, also uh, being uh, able to get nutritious food. And we all know we have talk, been talking about safe and nutritious food for, for the, the, the consumers. Now uh, we have been uh, also working uh, with the government uh, because to get all these technologies at scale, AGRA has developed uh, uh, an extension approach uh, using village-based advisors uh, called the VBAs. And first of all was uh, also to, to make sure this is a demand driven as it has been also highlighted in uh, the previous uh, presentations. And uh, so by doing so, we, we make sure uh, the, the message is going to small the farmers are really what they, they, they needed. And uh, also involving, as I said, uh, the government in all this process, uh, because we all know it's not uh, new, the ratio uh, uh, extension to farmers is still high in many of our countries. Going to one extension agent, for example, to 3,000 or 5,000 smallholder farmers, 
So the government is, uh, public sector is willing really uh, to, to, to get to the productivity to, uh, to, 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 to get the yield gap at the lowest possible. But so, uh, but due to this, um, uh, this constraint of not getting much extension agent in the ground, so seeing what the VBA's approach can do, so they were very uh, interested and uh, they are involved in the approach to really identify and select these VBA's to be able to, 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 to take the technologies uh, at scale to small all the farmers. And by doing so, uh, currently we have reached almost uh, 6 million smallholder farmers and we have developed uh, 30,000 uh, VBAs across nine countries. And uh, we can see government uh, are really interested. We can see it in Kenya, uh, around counties at uh, decentralized level, but also at national level in Burkina Faso, in Mali, and even here in Ghana, where I am. So, uh, and as it was uh, said, it's a very important the, the partnership, partnership between the private sector, between uh, our community development agencies, and uh, also involving government, because definitely the government is going to, to play the coordination role and to build a strong ME system in monitoring, because we need evidence based data going forward to, to showcase how we can really take all these technologies at, uh, at scale. So the partnership, collaboration, coordination from government is key. Thank you very much. If there are specific questions, I can come back to them. Microphone, Jonathan, please. Can you hear me now? Good. Okay, so my next question is to uh, Michael Sun, who is a partner at Dolberg Associates. And in this case, he's representing the broader digital advisory sector. Uh, Michael, uh, the question I have for you is, what are the key missing elements in relation to the various digitalization for agriculture initiatives uh, in relation to agronomy at scale, at scale or at space? Michael? Yes, hi. Uh, uh, hope, hopefully people can hear me. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, for, for the question. So, so I come at this question from a perspective of a, of a practitioner, and we, we look across um, digital agronomy, both private and public sector use cases, uh, with a particular focus on Africa. Um, and we really look at this at, at two layers, uh, and I think it's important to talk about both layers. Uh, the infrastructure layer, where a lot of digital agronomy sits, including crop maps, soil data, and sort of the, as one piece of the broader, broader digital agronomy infrastructure puzzle, it also includes weather data, water mapping data, pest and disease surveillance data, and so forth. And the application layer, where we're talking about the use cases, the more downstream use cases for digital agronomy, ranging from macro agri intelligence to advisory services, farm management tools, um, uh, uh, digital finance for farmers, and so forth. At the application layer, what we're seeing is that there is a growing evidence base around what use cases for digital agronomy work uh, from perspectives of impacts on smallholder farmer yields, incomes, crop waste loss mitigation, long-term resilience, growing accuracy of tools in terms of their predictive power. And we've heard today you know, a range of 60 to 80 uh, percent, which, which we're seeing increasingly, and that's, that's definitely creeping up uh, as these tools get better calibrated but still a real struggle to get to sustainable business models, particularly outside of the tightest um, and most commercial value chains. So, you know, on the cost side, uh, while costs of data capture analytics are, are falling rapidly, you still need human intermediation, which adds costs and operational complexity. And on the revenue side, the willingness to pay for insights enabled by digital agronomy, um, especially for less commercial crops is still low. At the, at the agronomy, digital agronomy infrastructure layer, uh, a few different challenges or gaps uh, per Jonathan's question, many of which to, to us boil down to the public good nature of a lot of these assets. So there's again this question of willingness to pay. So everyone needs soil data, crop maps, cuttings information, you know, agriculture specific weather data, but the willingness to pay for this 
by commercial actors, uh, or not to mention small farmers, is still low. And so the big missing piece for us there is continuing to build the business case of how and where digital agronomy delivers downstream value. Uh, and we just need more examples of success that talk the language of business and agribusiness. Um, there's a coordination question. So proliferation of initiatives and data sets, but still a great deal of fragmentation and siloing. Um, and so uh, you know, within CGER, you've got obviously the, the excellence in agronomy initiative and transform module tools like Guardian that are breaking those silos within CGIR. But it's, I think it's a much broader question. Um, and it's a question, both a technical question and an incentive question um, in the broader space around how data is sourced and shared. And then lastly, and I want to stop on this point, is this question of local institutional ownership and capacity. And I saw Christian raising a similar question in the chat box here. So, you know, who owns, operates, and funds digital agronomy public goods in the long term at the local level? And you know, ministries of agriculture are often poorly positioned to do this, uh, to own and operate such infrastructure, lack of capacity, lack of funding, uh, where you do have specialized entities like ATA in Ethiopia or Cholera in Kenya, even when they do exist, it's, it's sort of hard for them. They, they may lack the organizational mandate, the market orientation or, or the ongoing funding to do this. Um, and so, so there's this question of local ownership because without it, uh, it's very hard to make this work in both in terms of relevance, like who, who creates, generates local content, prioritizes use cases, integration with local data sets and ground truth data, and the issues of data sovereignty, security, and privacy. So to sum up, I think the technical challenges are addressable. Uh, there are obviously gaps there, but the institutional incentives and funding challenges, institutional ownership, that to us is probably the biggest piece still to be figured out. Good. Um, thank you very much for that very detailed uh, feedback, uh, Michael. Um, so the third and last question I'm going to ask will go to the agro-input industry, quite ably represented by Akim Doberman, who is the chief scientists at the International Fertilizer Association, IFA. Um, so Akim, uh, what could the excellence in agronomy 2030 contribute in view of the many ongoing investments in advisory services um, already invested in by the private agro-input sector? Akim, please. Yeah, and, uh, I'd like to start by saying that um, I think uh, also in the industry that particularly drives the supply and use of agricultural inputs there is an increasing realization that the old model of intensification and by, based on more inputs driving crop yields and profitability uh, is being replaced by a new model that requires much more holistic solutions that are much more tailored to the needs of different farming situations and uh, the industry that I represent now, the global fertilizer industry, for example, uh, has been discussing a significant shift in mindset for, for the last two years already uh, towards what we call a new paradigm for responsible plant nutrition. And this one actually has five major objectives. Uh, so one is to still to uh, offer uh, products and solutions that increase productivity, profitability, and resilience of farming systems and also the businesses that support them. But the other four objectives uh, are of a different nature. You know, so we need to also accelerate nutrient recycling from waste and under, uh, under, other underutilized resources. We want to improve uh, uh, soil health and sustain it. We recognize that the industry also needs to contribute to improving human nutrition and health so through a more nutrition sensitive agriculture. And then the, lastly, obviously, uh, we also need solutions that reduce greenhouse gas emissions and minimize nutrient pollution and avoid biodiversity loss. So you can see already, it's not in that particular case, uh, just about more or less fertilizer. Uh, it is in fact about practical solutions uh, that are much more complex and also require, I think, the collaboration and interaction of uh, many players involved in this uh, whole chain. And I think that's where the opportunity lies uh, also for the Excellence in Economy Initiative, uh, which is based on a lot of good work that has been done by scientists and others in the past decades already. And we've heard some of the use cases being mentioned, and particularly also in the CGIR, but the question has always been, 
how to scale this now up. And I think that's where the industry really comes in because uh, it still is the primary mechanism to deliver things to farmers uh, in addition to, of course, to knowledge-based delivery through um, national extension systems, uh, NGOs and other systems. But scaling these things up, uh, agronomic solutions uh, of a more complex matter uh, has been challenging, particularly in small order farming. That's what we are hoping now to overcome with this new approach. And of course, the digital solutions that have been mentioned before uh, provide interesting new tools to this, uh, but they, they also need to be based on a people-centric approach, in my view, and they need to be based on a new level of uh, collaboration and openness. So, for example, uh, we have decided to join this initiative uh, in particular in, in a number of these use cases, but also uh, through the creation of a new public-private consortium for what we call evidence-based uh, crop nutrition, where we really want to make sure that fertilizer recommendations and decisions uh, based on them and uh, are based on the best evidence that is possible. But we also want to create this evidence in a new way, much faster, much more rigorously, and much more tailored to individual situations in different uh, parts of the world. And the priorities uh, for that will be different in Africa than they are in Southeast Asia, or South Asia, or Latin America. We hope that we can learn across different regions uh, in this initiative, because uh, there's always uh, good examples uh, available in other parts of the world that can be transferred to, in a different way, of course, other uh, regions. You know. But we also hope that we can gain more interest among industry players uh, to join this uh, and actually become in, in themselves uh, more transparent uh, but also more science-based in many of these things. So that's kind of how to sum this up. It, it'll be not easy to convince industry that this is a, a really new opportunity um, in addition to investments that the industry is already making on its own. Uh, but I think uh, we are at a point where we have a lot to offer, and I look forward to be part of this initiative, and I will try my best to also connect it to many of our member companies and others that I know. Thank you very much, Akim. Um, so I think we still have a chance for at least one or two questions, and um, at this point, I want to check if there is anybody in the audience who wants to take the opportunity. I was scanning through the list of participants and... Uh, to see whether somebody has raised their hands, but I don't see one. Um, is there any? Well, if there is none, but I would like to give, uh, Banat, is there something that has come up in the chat box that you would like to address once again, please? Yeah, may, maybe maybe two comments. That I mean, there's a lot of comments, so I will obviously not go through all of them, but there's probably two I want to highlight. One is there was a question raised about how the 10 use cases were identified for this incubation phase. And I will be honest, they were identified a little bit opportunistically based on, on existing activities and so on, but we really want to, to test those co-creation processes, those demand-drivenness principles within those use cases. So we have to deliver something in, in 24 months and uh, could not afford really to start totally new cases. So they are really, a little bit opportunistic, but taking care of a diversity of systems, a diversity of, um, of uh, uh, regions, and, and of course, all the participating centers are involved in, in one way or the other. For the large project, we will do this differently. Um, as was mentioned a few times, I think Andy referred to it, we need to know exactly what is the potential for reaching agronomy at scale and, and developing or delivering agronomic gain for, for possible use cases. So we'll set up a framework for prioritization. Um, we'll do demand mapping in the public and private sector. Um, the, these are all activities that will happen during the incubation phase and then we'll apply that prioritization logic to those, those um, mapped opportunities to the private sector, the agro-input sector, the D4X sector and, 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 and the public sector. Uh, applying that logic to those mapped Opportunities will then generate the next generation of use cases, which we should be able to operationalize early 2022. So we will be more, more, um, more um, 
explicit about that. The second point I wanted to address, and then I will go back to you, um, uh, Jonathan, is the role of the national systems in this whole endeavor. As, as you know, the CGIR, its primary partner or national systems, national R and these uh, partners in, in all of the countries you are working. So in all the use cases, I think I've alluded to that they are fully part and parcel of, of what, what we plan to do. But again, in the incubation phase, we'll do an explicit mapping of needs, of, of gaps that national systems have to start engaging more directly with agronomy at scale. And I think we've talked about what that entails. We'll do an explicit mapping of needs. We'll talk to FARA and the sub-regional organizations probably to lead this. And afterwards, um, that will then result to, um, to a priority, to an investment starting again in 2022, responding to those, those key needs. Jonathan, I'm seeing two hands. By the way, um, maybe you need to allow some colleagues to also talk. Thanks, back to you. Yeah, thank you. So, um, yeah, I can see it's one hand. Uh, could you unmute uh, Shidima? And then please proceed. Hello? Chidima, your hand is up. Okay, um, let me give an opportunity to the Dr. Tarena Sanginga. I think there is a hand up from that side. Sorry. Unmute and then proceed. You are muted. I'm okay. Yes, now we can hear you. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank, uh, thank you very much for all the presenters. This is a very, very interesting uh, session. This is a very simple question, maybe to Bernard. Um, we didn't talk very much about the variabilities, uh, um, uh, the such uh, specific uh, side of agronomy and how we will try to handle that. But more importantly as well, um, how do we want to deal with uh, the diverse farming systems um, that exist in, uh, for, let's say for example in Africa, how do we handle that? And there's a very, very variability um, of site and the population and so on and so forth. So Bernard, I will let you respond to that before we switch over to the next part, Bernard. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, the diversity of farming systems is, is, is part of the site specificity that uh, you referred to in your first statement, uh, Sanginga. So um, one thing we need to do probably better, and we'll probably do this quite consciously in, in this initiative, is having a better, better justification for where we want to work, for what reasons. We've often been very driven by scientists' agendas, We've not been very explicit on, on um, deciding in which systems we are going to work, where is the potential for delivering agronomic gain largest, where are the conditions for uptake of, of agronomy intensification systems, where is it highest. And I do believe that we can do much better. And probably one of the big reasons why agronomy has not delivered is because we've not been very explicit about that. As I said in my notes, we'll take some of the approaches of the earlier system programs but try to avoid the sort of pressures and stresses that were also happening at that time and be much more explicit about what we are going to do where and, and with whom. The second part of my question is we need to be also explicit about who within those communities can intensify its systems. Um, when I say who, I mean which farmers, which type of farmers, which uh, segments are engaged in, in, um, in value chains, have access to resources to intensify and so on and so on. So that's going to be part and parcel also of being much more explicit about who we work with, where and, and for what particular purpose. Um, let me get back to you, Jonathan, because I see we need to probably move to the next uh, phase. Thanks, thanks for the questions. One last comment maybe. Please, if you have more questions, please uh, send them to the chat. In our final report, we will summarize all those questions and respond to them. And we will share that report with all of the people who are online here. So please, if you have more issues or questions, use the chat box. Thanks. Back to you, Jonathan. Right, Bernard. Thank you. Thank you for that reminder as well. So at this point, we, we need to just hear 
you know, an extra perspective from the donor community um, about what uh, the thoughts are about this uh, initiative. And um, at this point, I'm going to invite Dr. Alan Tolevy, who is the head of agricultural research at the UK Foreign Commonwealth Development Office. Um, yeah. Alan, uh, yeah. Thanks, Jonathan. And, and quick movement there to get FCDO in rather than DFID. <laughs> yeah, well done. Yeah. Yeah, we're all struggling with that one, I have to say. Um, yes, yeah, so I work, used to work for DFID. If it doesn't no longer exist as an organisation, we're part of the Foreign Office, Foreign, Foreign Ministry in the UK government. Well, and I've, I've listened to the talk, been really interesting and, and lots of detail. I'll, I'll, let me just lift this up a wee bit and, and uh, tell you what, what the, this sort of initiative looks like from where I'm sitting. Um, we're working really hard on the uh, COP26 preparations, COP now being put back at the end of 2021, and trying to uh, land an offer in that around agriculture R&D, and with, uh, with the support of the CGIR in doing that, and um, among other people, and the Gates Foundation and many others. And I think uh, within that debate it, it is the is the intention to understand food production and the food system in a way that Akim just mentioned, which is that food, the food system has to both uh, provide uh, livelihoods for many, many millions of people, provide safe, nutritious diets for people, to help people adapt to climate change and to, and to mitigate some of the worst impacts of climate change, to protect the environment and biodiversity. And these are major global challenges and at the heart of the response to many of those, and particularly the area where I think we're doing less well, is, is understanding and rolling out some of the key agronomic interventions that support those switches. I think that the evidence base around many agri agroecology uh, agri and many of the agronomic practices uh, is generally quite weak and, uh, and it's very fractured. We don't see a strong evidence base. If we look across the evidence supporting some of the cases that argue for interventions or investment in this area, we can see that the, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, but also many other places, the evidence base is not strong. And this is an issue when we're trying to argue for much scaled up investment in these interventions. Um, now there is very widespread, I think at this point in time, support for the idea that there should be a, 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 an international effort in the, in the development and application at scale of new R&D, and also a, an international effort to understand why things don't go to scale. I mean, somebody earlier made the reference of ready, to, ready you know, technological solutions, but not really scalable solutions. And we can see that in much of the evidence. So I think this, you know, the, the challenges that the platform, that the Excellence Economy platform is trying to take on, the challenge that lies right at the heart of the CGIR really, is um, that question of how do we understand what really works, where it works, why it works, and how can we overcome the barriers to adoption? And we work on the premise that if things are really, if, if really high quality R&D is cited within a, a good understanding of the system in which the technology is being applied, and for smallholders that means understanding the livelihoods and complexities of the livelihoods of farmers. But, you know, those system constraints operate in many different ways. If we understand those systems and we can develop that level of disaggregation of data and construct solutions that are helped, are co-designed by people who have to apply these, then I think we can try and overcome many of these barriers to adoption at scale. And, and the, the Excellence and Agronomy platform, I think, is addressing some of the key issues that the CG has been wrestling with for many years. So for us, it's really important. It sits right at the heart of our ability to sell within a major international uh, uh, process linked to the, the COP and the, uh, the next year, and COPs beyond that, obviously, it's not just linked to the next COP. Um, it, it, it's right at the heart of our ability to sell into that, the idea that, that we can develop and apply solutions at scale to some of these big intractable problems linked to food production and the food system more generally. So we're really excited by it. We think it's right at the center of the, what the new CGRs should be trying to do. Uh, I very much like what Martin Cox said at the start, that we this is the way we see the CG developing in the future. 
and uh, we're really supportive and we hope it goes really well. So uh, I'll stop now and uh, that's me. Thanks. Thank you, Alan. Um, just checking, um, I would like to also check if uh, Rob Bertram from USAID is on the call. Yes, thanks. Jonathan. Good. Okay, good. Please go ahead, Rob. Great. Thanks, Jonathan. Hi, everybody. And thanks to all the speakers. It's been a really great, interesting morning. It's a holiday here in the United States, but this was worth uh, foregoing the holiday to, to join this great discussion. Um, so I, for as long as I've been involved in the kind of work we're all in, this issue of genotype time, times environment times management that was brought up has been one of the great challenges we faced because of the challenges of site specificity. And it's so encouraging to hear from many of the speakers the advances that are being made in this space. Um, because overcoming those is really key to getting impact at scale. And this is impact we need for reasons relating to climate, but also for reasons relating to poverty and hunger and undernutrition and and, and, and uh, non-sustainable practices uh, and environmental degradation. So this is something we need for many different reasons. So I guess I'd like to take what I heard this morning and go a bit further and think about the EIA as a, sort of a nucleus for what happens at the scale of the one CGIR. And I know you all have been evolving this and advancing this and creating it as these changes have been taken. The one concern I have is the time frame we're looking at. Uh, I, I really, I heard, I think it was Bernard mentioned the, the big lift uh, issue. This is, this is at the heart of what uh, USAID is hoping for, and I think many other donors uh, out of uh, the C, one CGIR is that we will rebuild a large scale shared research agenda. Agronomy has to be central in that agenda. And EIA is the, the nucleus, it's the tools, it's the great methodologies that are applicable widely. I mean, you talk about the global south, for example. But what, what I think we would need, and I think, I hope I speak for some other donors as well, is the opportunity to see these uh, tools and methodologies applied in contexts, prioritized context, where we have both the potential that was mentioned by, I think, uh, uh, Meta and other speakers, or, or, or maybe it was uh, Mechlet, uh, but also um, the, the need in terms of the challenges, in terms of hunger, poverty, and undernutrition, and environmental degradation, and climate vulnerability. And, and, and so we would be really excited to be part of a discussion that goes forward building on the EIA, but it has to happen fairly quickly. I'm really talking about the next six to eight months uh, if we're going to have uh, something that donors are ready to, to step up and fund at scale, <laughs> to use that word in a different way, uh, it, it, starting in 2022. And I think what we'd be hoping for in, in USAID is uh, a, a set of programs in these prioritized geographies. And there's good work going on. You all have been involved with some of it. And there's others, uh, people like uh, the Global Futures Group, Keith Wiebe, Keith Fugley at ERS, uh, that could take this work and, uh, and, and help us prioritize these regions where we could come up with programs that were based on great agronomy but also included the integration of the best genetics, livestock and fish, all the pieces that are gonna drive poverty reduction. So agronomy is necessary, but not sufficient. And I guess that's the challenge I'd like to put to the group. How can we work together, you all who have led in this area and the donors to really have an offer that represents in a sense, the CGIAR's offer on climate adaptation. This, the work you're talking about and those environments is where the rubber hits the road for all the things we heard about, resource use efficiency, productivity gains, resilience gains, risk reduction, and so forth. So I'll stop there. So I'm very excited, but it's definitely a glass half full. And, and I do think we, all of us, have a challenge of how do we elevate this in the, in the coming months uh, as, as part of a system-wide offer uh, in this space. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rob. 
Um, so I'm already getting warnings about uh, the timing for the session and we are almost uh, busting the seams. Uh, Banat, at this point, I will give you a chance to just uh, briefly state what next, I mean, after all these um, presentations and discussions. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Thanks a lot very, very much to all the contributions and uh, sort of expectations. Um, I think especially the comments made by Alan and, um, and Rob are absolutely key and I think they are noted and, and they will be part of, of um, our, our next activities for, for the next half year or something. I think today we, we've demonstrated that there is space and probably need for a CGR-wide initiative on agronomy. And I think we've shown quite a bit of, we've not shown everything. As I said, there's a few other documents that have all the details, but I think you've heard a little bit about the strategy, the scope, the content, the sort of position, the approaches we will follow. But there's probably three things, or three remarks that you should probably go home with, beside all the other things, of course, you want to take note of. And excellence in agronomy, we are really demand driven and, and we will respond to meaningful demand for agronomy R&D solutions. So please engage with us, contact us. When we do the mapping, we will talk to all of you and, and try to see where your uh, wishes are in, in this particular space. The second point I wanted to make is that we are a partnership program. There were a few comments about external organizations. So we want to co-create solutions with partners. We want to put our R&D in the center of development initiatives and, and not looking for interest after we've done our science. We want to develop the science and the solutions that are absolutely in the center of development. And the third message, probably the most important one I wanted to leave behind is excellence in agronomy is under development. We have an incubation phase. I think I've talked about that. But we are also in the process of developing a big lift, a large project, whatever it will be called. So we, we are interested to continue to listen to all of you. Uh, we need your advice, your feedback, as we just heard from um, some colleagues, on how we can advance this initiative in the coming few months towards what really is considered as a big lift that will address and develop and generate all those impacts that the one CGR has committed to, to deliver on. So please, the input from everyone online and also people who are not online remain critical and will follow up on the specific constituencies after this launching. Very last of all, I really want to thank all the participants, especially also my CGIR colleagues, 